Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the uh, MGH Cancer Center Zoomcast series. I'm Dave Ryan, the Chief of Piedmont here, and I have Dr. Alyssa Letourneau, uh, who, is, who runs the MGH uh, uh, Antimicrobial <laughs> Stewardship Program. She's, she's an instructor of medicine at, at HMS, and really has been the go-to infectious disease specialist uh, for the Cancer Center these last several years and has been a, a tremendous gift to the Cancer Center. And so we're lucky enough to have her here to talk to us today about this breaking news of remdesivir in the COVID-19 crisis. So Alyssa, before we get to that, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where are you from? Uh, where'd you do your training? That kind of thing. <laughs> I'm getting paged as well. Um, so I am originally from um, New Hampshire. I grew up in New Hampshire and I did my undergraduate training at um, Brown University in Rhode Island. And then I spent a year in Vermont and then I went to Yale School of Medicine in Connecticut and then moved to Boston to do my training um, first in internal medicine and pediatrics here at Mass General. Um, and then I continued on, stayed on and did my infectious disease fellowship in the combined program, which is Mass General and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then I stayed on at Brigham and Women's and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to do an extra training year in taking care of immunocompromised patients. So both uh, bone marrow transplant patients, leukemia patients, all oncology patients and any solid organ and transplant patients, and then was hired back here at Mass General, which I call my home, uh, to run our antimicrobial stewardship program, which intersects a lot with the cancer center and patients who are immunocompromised, because we use a lot of antibiotics in these patients. And the whole program is trying to figure out how to best use antibiotics, um, antimicrobials, so antivirals as well, and antifungals in large patient populations across the hospital. And so we have kept busy with our uh, inpatient services right now who uh, are taking care primarily of COVID-19 patients and thinking about who really does need antibiotics, um, who can we get on clinical trials, um, et cetera. So it's been exciting. So I'm born and bred New England and have lived in every New England state except for Maine. So, but I grew up a mile from the Maine border, so I almost call it I home as well. Oh, you <laughs> no, you're good. So, um, so let's go straight to the remdesivir data. And then after we talk about the remdesivir data, then let's put it in context of, okay, this is the average COVID-19 patient. Um, where do we use it and how do we use it? So tell us, tell us what, um, was it Gilead? Uh, is, uh, Gilead so there are a couple, yeah. So there are a couple things that came out um, this week. So um, Gilead had, um, has released some preliminary data or has released a press release. I shouldn't say they've released the actual data for us to review about their randomized control trial, which was a placebo controlled trial where patients either got remdesivir or got a placebo. So remdesivir is a, is a broad spectrum antiviral. It had been studied um, in actually the Ebola uh, epidemic, um, but actually had stopped enrolling because Ebola had sort of fizzled away at that time. But it is known to have some activity against coronaviruses. So there's been a randomized control trial um, that is multi-center, so in multinational, international, so in the United States, Europe, and Asia, which has been run, and, and we were actually one of the sites here at MGH for it as well. Um, so they have released some of the preliminary data on their first about 400 patients, which suggests that patients who received the drug um, did, are having shorter clinical courses and clinical illness than patients who did not. So. Um, shortened Ill duration of illness from 15 days to 11 days. Um, and it was about 31% of patients who received remdesivir um, did that. So that doesn't seem like quite that much, but in the, the era of infections and viral illnesses, that's actually pretty good in terms of those numbers. Um, they have not looked at all of their data, so they had initially decided to enroll about 400 people, and that is the data that they have looked at, and that's the, the, the press release is based on that information from our understanding, and then they ended up enrolling many more patients to try to, to get um, a better sense, and since there were so many ill patients um, across the world, essentially, to try to see if we can get better data and have a better um, understanding of how this drug works or doesn't work in um, patients. Also of note, they, it seems like they were tending to enroll sicker patients initially and have sort of tried to, to see if they can enroll um, less ill patients because the thought would be obviously antivirals work better 
in general, antivirals work better earlier on in disease when the virus is replicating as opposed to later on in the disease where patients might be ill from the effects of the virus and the immune response from that. So it's encouraging, but I would say we, we, we need to, be, to, to wait for the full peer review and, and all of the data to be released. Interestingly as well, there was a paper published this week on the same day um, in Lancet with the data out of China, which was a China study across um, 10 hospitals, I believe, in China, um, which again was a similar study looking at remdesivir versus placebo. Um, they had to actually stop their trial early um, because the pandemic was clearing. And so essentially they didn't have any more patients to enroll. So those data suggest that there's no difference in terms of patients who received the drug and who did not, but the trial was not powered anymore because of the, the drop in the number of patients in the trial decreases the ability to actually sh show that. So, so I would say that trial is inconclusive at this point, and we can't say that the drug doesn't work because it wasn't powered, um, it wasn't powered for the number of patients that they were able to enroll. And there was no survival advantage, correct? On the on the uh... neither neither was able to show that there was a survival advantage. There was a trend in the data, the press release that Gilead um, released that may it was you know the p value was close to 0.05, but but did not make that. But we will see sort of um, when they release all of the data whether that that holds with the larger um, a larger patient uh, cohort. Um, the other thing with the um, China data as well is that patients received a lot of additional therapies in addition to the drug. So patients could receive um, another antiviral called lopinavir ritonavir, which is used in the early days of HIV. Um, they, many patients actually got corticosteroids, um, which is not necessarily recommended in these types of illnesses. And so it's unclear how much, the, it was randomized, so it was about the same in both of those patient populations, but it's unclear if maybe that played a role as well in, in how patients were doing. And that was seen, that was, um, that was uh, not allowed in the NIH um, trial in the United States that was at Mass Journal. You couldn't be in, you couldn't receive these other um, agents. Uh, you could get steroids if you needed them, but the other antivirals were not recommended. And the inclusion criteria for the trial that we participated in, um, it was pre-ICU phase, correct? Initially, the first, the beginning of the trial, you could be in the ICU. Actually, the first patient who received it was a patient who was in the intensive care unit um, and was intubated and was very ill. Actually, I um, was taking care of that patient. Um, uh, but later on, they actually changed their um, inclusion, changed their um, sort of, uh, directed patient population to try to get patients that were earlier in illness, thinking that we could we could protect them from going to the emergency department, but going these, to the ICU. I see. These weren't people who were at home with COVID-19. These were people in the hospital, correct? Correct. So you had to have some mild to moderate disease. So patients needed to come and be in the hospital, be ill, um, and usually required, you know, either oxygen, have a chest x-ray that looks like COVID-19, have a positive test. Um, so things that would have them in the hospital, not, not at home, not people who were doing okay at home. And how is it dosed? Is it oral? Is it IV? It's only available intravenously, and usually it's one dose, um, a higher dose on the first day, and then of 200 milligrams, and then 100 milligrams daily for, for a total of 10 days. Um, patients in the trial who were doing well enough to go home before those 10 days could go home. They didn't have to stay here to get the drug, um, but that is the typical way that it is dosed. And the classic side effects uh, associated with remdesivir? So the things we look out for are um, liver abnormalities. So it has liver toxicity is the main one that, that we worry about in patients. So anyone who has liver disease or is on medications that might cause liver disease, um, that was one of the things that we needed to watch out for. Okay. So let's take a step back now and let's say, okay, in the, in the average world of COVID-19 infection, how is this gonna, how is remdesivir gonna fit in and how should patients and families think about it uh, yeah. going forward? Yeah, so the issue right now is that it's not available um, at all in terms of being able to get it um, on our formulary or in the hospital. It is available, um, Gilead has a compassionate use program, so it is available for children in whom it has not been studied, as well as in pregnant women. 
And so we're able to get that um, as an emergency use in the hospital for those patients. Um, you know, it looks like the FDA probably will try to, to push this through to get approved, depending what these data look like. And at that point, um, it'll be really a drug supply issue. So whether or not we'll be able to actually get drug, because even for the trial, it was difficult to get remdesivir to the hospital um, due to their production. So that'll be one of the main things. And then we're gonna have to think, um, looking at the criteria by which these patients got into the trial, you know, which patients are the best ones to get it. So patients who are coming into the hospital who are ill, those are the patients, you know, that we're worried may need to go to the ICU at some point or are going in that direction that perhaps those are the patients we, we would give it to as opposed to a patient who's being seen in a clinic and is well enough to go home. It's, kind of, it's also kind of hard to imagine that um, a 10-day IV injection or IV infusion uh, for an outpatient is going to be <laughs> yeah. manageable right. um, in the current healthcare uh, era uh, that, yeah. we, that we have. Um, and I imagine also that there'll be an oral formulation or an attempted at oral formulation at some point in the future, in the near yeah. future, but not right now. Not right now. I would yeah. assume they would try to look into that. I do not know all the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the drug to know whether or not that is feasible. But yeah, I think that would be something that, you know, obviously would be, if it, if it really shows that this is, this is what's going to be good, that that would be, that would be ideal. And so, if not, whether or not a study looking at, you know, you give a dose or two in the clinic um, yeah. on two, two consecutive days, whether that would help people. So it feels a little bit like the rugs rugs been pulled out from underneath us, or the chair's been pulled uh, back, <laughs> and sitting down. In the sense of, um, here's this great drug, but we can't get it. Um, yeah. I guess unless you're on a clinical trial, or unless there's a clinical trial ongoing at the hospital you're at, um, do we have any clinical trials at Mass General with remdesivir now? So or we were. So Libby Homan, uh, Dr. Libby Homan, who um, is one of the infectious disease doctors here at Mass General, she is the one who ran the, this INIH study here for remdesivir. She was the principal investigator. We were actually the third um, highest enrolling site um, internationally. She enrolled 49 patients. Um, so kudos to her and her team. That is a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of data that they needed to gather for that. But currently, as I said, there's we do not have that trial. Uh, that trial has closed, and so we don't have um, access to remdesivir here. There is still an ongoing um, trial at the Brigham of remdesivir, and they're looking at five days versus ten days of therapy. Um, and the Gilead had released it had a press release on that those data as well, stating that they think. Um, the five days work just as well as the 10 days. So we'll have to wait again to get the full data there, but it sounded like it was encouraging um, from that standpoint as well. Um, we do have other clinical trials enrolling here at Mass General. There's a tocilizumab trial, which is looking at tocilizumab and anti-IL-6 um, monoclonal antibody that against um, placebo. And the thought process around that is that um, there's a huge inflammatory response from this um, infection. And that once the, it may be that the virus goes away and then it's actually our inflammatory response that is causing a lot of the illness. And so trying to temper that down with a medication. Um, and so that trial is currently enrolling here. We also are enrolling um, in the ORCID trial, which is a, a national trial as well. Um, which is looking still at hydroxychloroquine versus placebo because that study actually has not been done yet in a in a randomized fashion to actually have appropriate data. The current cohort data, retrospective data that's been published looks like it's not um, it is not useful, but but we don't have clear randomized control trials for that. And then there's an inhaled nitric oxide, um, which is a vasodilator to try to help patients um, breathe better, which has been enrolling for some time now. Um, that's a mass general trial only, I believe, run by one of the anesthesiologists. So, so unfortunately, remdesivir is not available currently here. And again, we will have more data as we see what the FDA decides and sort of what the supply chain will be in, in what we can do, so. Really interesting. So. Um, so walk us through in the last few minutes what the average patient experience is getting COVID-19 and then walk us through what the average hospitalized patient uh, experience is getting COVID. Yeah. So I'd actually say there's probably three. So there's, there's the, scarily, there's the COVID patient who's asymptomatic, who has nothing, and we yes. don't know that they're infected. Um, and those are the patients we're trying to find or we have found in some smaller trials, um, smaller 
groups. For example, there's been patients who have been screened in homeless shelters here in Boston that have shown that uh, many of the, the people living in the homeless shelter have no symptoms yet test positive on a, on a nasal swab, which is, which is the best test we have in terms of seeing if someone has the infection. Um, so there's that whole patient population. I think there's a group of people who feel crummy, have fevers, you know, can have a wide variety of symptoms, but fevers, runny nose, sore throat, cough, headache, um, breathing issues, um, and then a little, some people up to, they're saying, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30% may have GI symptoms related to this and have any or all of those um, symptoms. And some of those will do fine. They'll be at home and, and treat themselves like a regular viral illness. And then you have the patients who come into the hospital, typically having had some of those symptoms. And then around day seven to 10, they start having much more difficulty breathing and need oxygen and come into the hospital needing oxygen. And then those patients, you know, come in, usually are on oxygen, usually have a chest x-ray that's pretty impressive in terms of disease and then may or may not have all of these inflammatory markers that we're seeing, which is which is very interesting. So normal um, white blood cell count, um, a low lymphocyte count, um, and then they have elevated C-reactive protein, elevated ferritin, elevated D-dimer, any combination of that, which again is sort of this thought of this inflammatory response that the body is having. And mind so, you, we don't, these are not tests that we normally check in all of these okay. people and they were sort of figured out, you know, in China as, as they were seeing how sick people were becoming. So it may just be very well be that these tests go up in patients who have viral illnesses and we just don't know, but, but it's, it's marked in terms of what we've seen in, in these, this patient population. So when you, just to clarify, when you say disease on the chest x-ray, you're referring to these fluffy infiltrates uh, throughout the lungs? Yes, yeah, so very, so usually both sides um, and white patchy, um, everything from scattered to full on white out, depending on it. And it's, it's been interesting to hear um, some of the patient presentations on some of the calls I've been on where, um, and even, you know, patients I have seen where really you look at the patient and you say, okay, they need a little oxygen, they're breathing a little fast, but they don't look terrible. And then you get the chest x-ray and the chest x-ray is, is much worse than the patient, how the patient looks in front of you. And I think that's what's been scary and humbling for many of us um, who are taking care of these patients. Well, any last comments for the MGH Cancer Center community at large out there? Yeah, so I think keep doing what you're doing. So obviously try to stay at home, try to keep yourself um, isolated, unfortunately, for a little bit longer. Um, it's working, at least, you know, in this area. It looks like the, our curve is flattening, but the, the slope up is much faster than the slope down. So it's going to take a little time for us to get back to, to a new way of living that will involve us going out a lot more. So I think that, you know, the same things, you know, wash your hands, masks when you're going out, um, keep sick people away, try to stay isolated from sick people because it's, we still have a lot of work to do before we can say that, that we can go back to, to our lives doing everything we, we, we would like to be doing, so. Well, you and your team have just done an absolutely outstanding job here at the, at the General and uh, you're really just, uh, you and the entire infectious disease team are in the greatest tradition of the Mass General uh, physicians that have gone before us. So thanks for everything and, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.